fast task inference with variational intrinsic successor features or visor for short. This is actually one of my personal favorite papers that I've read recently. And that is because it uses two very neat ideas within reinforcement learning and combines them to come up with a really neat idea that essentially allows generalization of knowledge to learn new tasks incredibly quickly. Now, if that doesn't make too much sense to you, don't worry because I plan to break it all down in this video. I wanna give you all an idea of why I think this paper is really neat and also dive into a bit of depth into how this paper works. To get started, I want to use an example. So you can see I've drawn a grid here on the right, and that is for that example. So this is a grid world. So let's say we have an agent down here in the right, this little blue triangle here. And then let's say we have a few of these dots in the environment. What these mean, we don't necessarily know yet, but the setup for this learning task that we're going to use is that we're going to say this blue agent down here has time to explore the environment. And when I say explore, I mean, it can just go around and do whatever it wants. It could, you know, go like this and it can essentially do whatever it wants. Now, after some time of exploring, say, I don't know, something, we could even give it something large, like a million steps to explore, then we're gonna give it a task. So maybe the task will be to get a red dot. So we'll give it some reward function that gives it a, you know, a positive reward when it gets to one of these red dots. And if you haven't worked with machine, sorry, not machine learning, but reinforcement learning before, this is essentially how these problems work. You're trying to learn from a reward signal, which means that the reward signal might be something like, you know, when you get to a red dot, we get a positive reward. And we wanna learn from that signal. Now, if you use a standard reinforcement learning algorithm that you've probably heard of before, the issue is that even if we give it a million time steps to learn while it doesn't have a reward, and then after those million time steps, we give it a reward function, but say only a hundred steps to maximize and learn that reward function, well, it's probably not gonna learn anything because a hundred steps is not that much. And you might be like, well, we have a million plus that 100, right? And while we do have that extra million, most of these algorithms in reinforcement learning, they can't make use of that. Even if they can explore and they can figure out how to get this green dot or figure out how to get this red dot, they don't take time to explore that. Visor, on the other hand, says, you know, that's that doesn't make sense. We have all this time where we're not doing anything. We might as well use it to explore and learn things. So maybe it wants to learn things like how to get to the other side of the map. Maybe it wants to learn how to get to a green dot. These are all different things it can learn. Now, say it gets the reward function. Now it can use these quote unquote skills it's learned to maximize this reward function very quickly. And that's why I really love this paper. It's about generalization. It's about learning and applying what you learn to different types of problems. And the two ideas that it uses for achieving this are learning diverse policies, which is sort of the skills thing I just talked about. So a skill from getting from one side of the map to the other side of the map is an example of that. But then it combines that with, with a framework called successor features that allows it to reuse those in a way that's very smart to adapt to new tasks incredibly quickly. And by the end of this review, when we look at the results, we'll see that not only can this work for something like this, but this actually even works on more complex environments like Atari fairly well with a fairly limited amount of time actually having a task or some reward function. So if that sort of thing sounds interesting to you, you're probably going to really enjoy this video. And if this sort of thing is the kind of thing you like to watch, also consider subscribing to the channel. I do make a whole lot of content like this, and I really do appreciate every one of you that subscribes. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, I do want to jump into it and start with one of the things I just mentioned, successor features. This is an idea that I think is really neat and lots of people don't know about. Maybe people do. I, I didn't know about it before uh, I got into it quite recently. So successor features starts with this assumption that you see right here. This is the core equation you definitely need to understand. And luckily it's quite simple. All it's saying is that the reward that we get from a transition is equal to phi of that transition with the dot product with this delta. W vector. So what is phi and what is W? Well, phi is quite simply a feature vector. So these feature vectors could be really any feature vectors we learn. And W is, at least the way they put it in this paper, is weights that specify how desirable each feature component is or a task vector for short. So it specifies some sort of task. Now, this equation number two alone isn't very significant. What is very important is once we take this and plug it into the equation down here, we get a very, very interesting result. So what you see here is a discounted sum of these phi or feature vectors. So what that means is that from the very start of the episode, we have like phi one, and then we have phi two, and we have uh, a bunch more phi's so phi to maybe n if we're doing an episodic case. So we essentially add all these up, but we also discount them. So we'll discount each of these by a gamma term. And in successor features, this discounted sum of feature vectors is referred to as this little psi right here. So this equals, so I guess it's common. These should be 
added together, these together equal psi of pi. So what is psi of pi? Intuitionally, you can kind of think it as just a prediction, or not necessarily a prediction, just the future feature vectors we expect to see. Roughly something like that, right? So why does it have this little pi right here? Well, that's because imagine you're playing chess and you're trying to predict what the future is going to look like. Well, the future is going to depend a lot on the player you're looking at, right? If you're looking at a novice player, well, you probably have no clue what's going to happen because there's so many different things that they could do. Whereas if you're looking at an advanced player, you can probably have a pretty good prediction of how a lot of things are going to play out. So this pi is our policy or essentially how we determine which actions to take. So we can determine a psi for a specific policy, but do note this because it's very important. We can't have these successor features in this psi, by the way, these are the successor features. I'll call them SFs for short. We can't have successor features if we don't have a policy that those successor features are based on. So I've defined psi now. So now you can see we're doing the same thing up here, uh, but we're doing it with psi this time. So we're taking this psi of pi and we are taking the dot product of it with this w or this task vector. And what's very, very interesting here is that we get this q of pi. So what is q of pi? If you're not familiar with this, it's just how good this action is if we're in this state. So it's essentially how good a certain move is if we're in chess, maybe how good moving this specific pawn is uh, for it. How good is that move? Or what is the expected discounted sum of rewards that we'll get from it? So why is this important? Why is it important to know Q and why is this so significant? Well, this is significant because it means if we can predict the future of features that we're going to see, then we can predict the future rewards. And if we can predict the future rewards, and sorry, it's not the rewards exactly, but rather the Q value, if we can predict the Q value accurately, then well, say we have three different moves we can make on a chessboard. We can maybe move the rook to one position, or we can move this pawn, or we can move this second pawn. If we just take the action with the highest Q value, well, that's going to get us the highest reward and do the best. Now, that's assuming our predictions are correct, but if we have an accurate value, that will always be the case. So I just said a lot right there. So let me, let me sum that up for you. If we make the assumption that rewards are the dot product of this phi vector and this w task vector, so the feature vectors and some task specification, then we can extrapolate that to say that if we can predict what the future features are going to look like, we can get the q value. And if we have the q value, then we know which action is going to be the best action to take for us. If you're familiar with reinforcement learning, you might not be super impressed yet because there's a number of ways we can actually learn Q, right? We can learn this Q through something like Q learning, which is a very popular RL method. So why are we doing this complicated step of breaking the reward and the Q value into these two different parts, the feature part, so the feature part is this psi, and the task specification part, this W. And the reason why we're doing this is because if we do this, so if we scroll back up to this grid world example over here, I can kind of explain why this is so important. Why this is important is that if we have these successor features and then we have W, well, let's say we go back to the case we had earlier where we have time to explore. Well, while we're exploring, we can learn the successor features without any reward. Because remember, the successor features are just what feature vectors we expect to see. And those don't depend on any reward. They just depend on what our agent's going to do. Like maybe it always likes to go like this, or maybe if it ends up at this place, it always goes straight up. I don't know. There's a number of things it might do. But then when we do introduce the task, instead of having to learn an entire Q value function, and to learn a Q value function is not easy, right? It's essentially learning the combination of these both. Instead of having to learn all of that, we just have to learn W. We only have to learn what the task specification is, or essentially like what the reward signal is. And because of that, this whole adapting to new tasks becomes a lot easier and we can get a whole lot of value out of these times when we don't have any reward function. And that is why this is so significant. So that alone is already pretty neat, but we can actually take this even another step further if we move on to universal successor features, which happens right down here. Remember earlier how when I was talking about the successor features over here, I mentioned that we need to be, we, we can't forget about this pi here because the successor features very much depend on our policy. Well, universal successor features says, why don't we make this in a way that we can learn the successor features of any policy? And in fact, that is exactly what they do. Or these successor features for all policies are called universal 
successor features. And they're very similar to the successor features we saw before. So this is the form we saw before. And now we're just moving over to this form where instead of having successor features for a specific policy, we pass in the parameters or some part of that policy to get those successor features, right? So this would be the successor features for the state action pair if we're under this policy. And now what we can do is if we could learn this function, well, we can get the Q value for any policy for a given task vector. And that is a very neat thing. It might not be immediately obvious how this could be significant, but one thing that we can do, and they do this later in the paper, is maybe we are trying to figure out what the best action is, and we want to do essentially what we were talking about before, right? We calculate the Q values using this method right here, right? We just take the successor features of a policy, and we take the dot product of that with this task specification vector. Well, what if instead of just doing that once, we did a bunch of different times for a bunch of different policies? Well, we would end up with the Q values for policy one, the Q values for policy two, and you know, so on. We can, we can keep doing this as much as we want for as many policies as we have, so long as we can calculate them with this psi function right here. And if we can do that, well, the, we can actually compare all these Q values individually, and we can take the action that performs the best out of all of these instead of out of just one policy. Now that might be a little confusing and I don't wanna hound on it right now because we will come back to this later, but that essentially wraps up successor features. Now there is still a lot more in this paper, but I do wanna take a brief break, just brief pause because I think that was a lot of information, a lot of dense information we just went over. So if that was confusing to you, which no shame if it was, this was confusing to me, really confusing the first time I read it. Feel free to go back over this. I'll have the paper linked in the description, uh, but just a summary. Summary is that we have successor features. Successor features breaks down rewards into two parts. The feature vectors, and I should use a different color here, the feature vectors and the task vector. And also the Q function can then be broken down into the successor features and the task vector. Why is this important? Well, this is important because if we can learn the successor features, which can be learned without a reward function beforehand, well then any time we want to learn how to do a new task, all we have to do is learn the task specification vector or W. So it's essentially a way to transfer what we've learned to new tasks in a way that is much more efficient than if we had to relearn everything from scratch. And that essentially sums it up. Once you've understood that, now we can move on to the next big part of the paper, and I'm going to erase this all so that we have a clean, fresh start. So the next big part of the paper deals with sort of a weakness of successor features. And that weakness comes from this formula right here that I said is so core. And remember, this equation right here is essentially an assumption that we're making, right? We're assuming that our feature vectors can be linearly transposed and multiplied with W to get the reward function, but this might not actually be the case. For example, if we have really bad features, like maybe we're playing chess, but our feature vector is just always a vector of zeros, and it doesn't tell us anything about the state of the game, well, then we're not going to be able to learn the reward function from that, right? It's just going to be impossible. So that's a bit of an extreme example. But the point being is that we need good features. And if we don't have good features, well, this just isn't going to work. One obvious question to ask from this is, well, how do we make good features? And what, what are good features, right? And this is a difficult question because if we're working towards some specific goal or some specific reward, well, the answer will be the features are going to be something that helps us get towards that reward, but we're not trying to maximize any specific reward. Rather, we want to learn general features that are going to apply to a wide range of tasks that we haven't seen yet, that we don't know what they're going to be. So we essentially need to inject some sort of bias into this algorithm that will hopefully help us learn representations that are general in some sense. So the way the authors opt to learn these feature representations in this work is through this behavioral mutual information. And that behavioral mutual information is expressed mathematically right here in equation six. Now, this might be a bunch of gibberish to you, so let's go through this part by part. The I right here is what is called mutual information, and this is a mathematical term. And in, inside of this, we have Z and a function of this tau means the trajectory of this policy. So a trajectory or a play out or essentially one instance of the agent going through an episode of a game or an environment. 
And z in this case is a policy conditioning vector, which essentially means we have some policy, but this policy, instead of being conditioned on just a state and an action, it's also conditioned on z. So essentially z is some variable that affects the behavior of this policy or or another way that people also often refer to it in similar literature is it's called a skill vector sometimes because different Z's give different policies or in a sense, different skills, or at least that's kind of what they're aiming for. So what is the mutual information between these? Well, what that means on an intuitive level is that we want to as close to possible have a one-to-one -one mapping of skills to unique trajectories, which means that for every skill, we want to be able to figure out what trajectory it's likely going to produce. And for every trajectory, we want to be able to predict which skill was likely used to produce this trajectory. And the mathematical way of writing that is through entropy right here. And you can see they sort of do this derivation and we'll, we'll get back to that. But back to this idea of what it intuitively means is it means that we want each of these skills or every time we use a different Z to condition our policy, well, we want it to produce very different or unique behavior. We want the trajectories produced by policies conditioned on different values of Zs to be unique and distinguishable from each other. And that's why it's often called a skill vector because if they're distinct from each other, then they're different skills, so to say. I will very briefly mention that I'm talking in terms of skills, but there's actually a whole another way that lots of people like to talk about this. And it is, we're essentially learning a representation that allows us to control the environment or learn a representation that only represents things that are controllable by our agent, things that we can control in our environment and ignores things that we cannot control. Why that's the fact, interesting thought experiment. I leave that up to you, uh, but that is another way people like to look at this. So now that you've got that, what you can see kind of what they do here is they take this math down all the way to here where they derive a loss function. And what this loss function essentially says is here Q is a discriminator. So this discriminator wants to predict whether Z was the skill that was actually used to produce S. This should be one because that would mean, you know, if Z is the real S, then it had a 100% chance to generate this state. Anyway, I, I don't think the math is too important to go over right here. You can, you know, you're more than welcome to look over it in your free time, but this is the loss function that will eventually be used or something very similar to this is what will be used to learn our feature representations. So again, this is a very big part of the paper that we went over. So just to very quickly review that, we have a Z which is a policy, con policy conditioning variable, or essentially a Z represents a different skill, a different value of Z represents a different skill. And what we're essentially trying to do is we're trying to maximize the mutual information, this I term between this skill that we're using and the trajectories that it produces so that it produces very different behaviors for different skills. And we derive a loss function down here that will allow us to achieve that and achieve that by changing the representation. Hence, we're learning a representation that gives us policies that have very different skills they can use. And just to note that when we use this with successor features, this is very nice because if we're using a bunch of policies that have the exact same behavior, well, that, that wouldn't work out too well and we'll get into why that's the case. But having these diverse policies is I think a very key part of this paper uh, or why it works quite well. And now that we've gotten through this next big part of the paper, we can now combine the last two things, the successor features and this mutual information maximization. So we're gonna skip over the graphic for now and we'll come back to it. But here you can see the variational intrinsic successor features. This is where they talk about combining these two methods in a neat way. And when I say combine these methods, I literally mean combine them. One thing you might have noticed is that both successor features and I'll just call it MI for short, the behavior mutual information maximization. Both of these use some sort of vector to do their learning. So in the successor feature case, we get this W vector or this task vector. And in the BMI case, we have Z, which is the skill vector. So what they do here to bring these together is they say, what if we stipulate that W needs to equal Z? And if we do that, well, these algorithms actually come together very elegantly. Now, the obvious question here is why do this? Why are we setting W equal to Z? This I think is the most confusing part of the paper to me personally. I can come up with one reason why I think this is something that is helpful. And one is that it just reduces the number of variables that we have to deal with. Instead of having to deal with W and Z, 
now we only have to deal with one of them, which we refer to as W. And that just reduces the complexity of the algorithm. That's nice, but I don't think that this is the only reason that this is helpful. The other reason that I think exists though, they don't really talk about much, but I wanna kind of explain to you my thought process here. And total disclaimer, I, I might be wrong on this. I'm really not entirely sure. So let me know in the comments what you think of this and, and whether or not you can figure this out. And what my thoughts essentially were here is remember how when we were talking about universal successor features, so we have this, remember it depends on not just the state and the action, but also the policy that we're using. However, universal successor features, this policy that you pass in is actually very important. I forget if I mentioned this earlier, but one of the really cool guarantees about universal successor features, and heck, this is really the core importance of it, is that when we pass this policy in, what we're essentially doing is we're guaranteeing that we'll get out a policy that is better than this once we do this dot product with the W vector. We're guaranteeing that if we follow this Q value that this produces, this Q value is going to give us a policy that's better than this one that we passed in. However, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be good. So take the example of Mario, right? So say we have, I don't know how to draw Mario, but you got your little head and your little body and your little feet. Very nice. Let's say we're playing Mario and you have the level right here and the level, you know, generally Mario, you keep running right. You keep running right and you eventually get to the flagpole and then you win. Yay. Um, but imagine that your agent, instead of going right, it only goes left. Maybe this is your policy. It just runs in the left of the map and it does that forever until it dies because of a timeout. <laughs> That's a really bad policy. And if the policy we're passing into our successor features right here is this policy, this, this terrible policy, well, and I should probably draw that in blue to be more clear. If this policy we're passing into our universal successor features function is this policy that is absolutely terrible, well, even when we get this Q, this, this policy that's supposed to be better, it, <laughs> I mean, anything is better than this, right? Like we're, we're not going to be learning much, but if the policy that we're passing in is already doing pretty good, maybe not perfect, but pretty good. Maybe it's getting like half the way there. So it's getting like to here and then like dying. Well, a policy that's going to be better than that is 100% of the time going to be better than a policy that's just this running left policy. So I think the reason that setting W equal to Z works pretty well is it's in some way helps out with what this input policy is. And this probably won't make sense as to why this is the case until we look at the full algorithm. But that is my guess. If again, if you have any ideas about this, or you, you think I'm wrong, or you think I'm right, or maybe I'm almost right, let me know in the comments, because this is the thing that has confused me the most about this paper. And I think it's probably the most important thing about this paper. I'm, I'm surprised they don't talk much about it really at all. Or if they did, it went over my head. Anyway, that kind of wraps up the talk about the specifics of the algorithm. So now I'm going to go over an overview. We're going to come back to this diagram up here, and I kind of want to explain what's going on here. I'm going to be honest, I don't love this diagram, but I think it should make sense if I'm explaining it to you as we go. So essentially what happens is we start off with a W. How do we get the W? We kind of sample it semi-randomly. It, it's sampled from some distribution. The, the specifics are in the paper, but we sample some W. So this is some task, right? And we do this at the start of every episode. So once the you know game of Mario or the game of chess, when, once it starts, we sample our task vector, and this goes to two places. The first place it goes is down to the discriminator. Now remember this Q, this discriminator, this is in charge of learning our representations. And you'll see that our representations are right here on the right. So we have the phi and what is happening is we get in a state and then this comes up through here and we get the feature vectors or this phi. We then learn this phi by trying to maximize this function right here. And this is essentially derived from the last term that we saw earlier with the BMI stuff. And that is how we learn our feature vectors. This is actually quite quite simple. The logic and reasoning behind it is a bit complicated, but the algorithm itself is quite simple, which I like. Then the other pathway we have is W also comes over here to the policy, and this is the successor features pathway. So in the successor features pathway, again, we have the same thing where we start with the state down here, it comes up here, and it goes through a separate network. So a key thing to note here is our feature vectors on the right and our successor features on the left these are being learned by different networks, right? So the feature vectors, how are, sorry, not the feature vectors, the successor features, how are they learned? 
they are learned through temporal difference learning. So if you've done something like Q learning before, you're going to notice this right here. This is the target. We're essentially saying that we're, we're bootstrapping, right? We're saying that the successor features for this current state should be the feature vector for this state plus the discounted successor features for the next state. I, I don't want to go into why this is the case right now. If you've never seen this, this is pretty standard in reinforcement learning though. Look up temporal difference learning um, if, if you're confused though. And then the actions that are taken in this environment as we sort of explore, I, I mean, we're not really exploring, um, but, but what's happening is we just take the dot product of the successor features we're learning with the task vector. And that gives us a Q function, right? Um, and if we take the maximum action, over those Q values, we get our policy. So we just take that action uh, that goes into the environment and then we move on to the next step and we keep doing this and keep doing this until the end of an episode. And then we sample a, for this, you know, this is the, now the second episode, we sample a new W and we repeat this whole thing. So if I scroll way down here, all the way to the, where is it? Uh, I forget what this is called, the something decks. Oh my gosh, why can't I remember? We have an algorithm here. I'm not going to go over this in depth because this is kind of just what I explained. But if you are a little bit confused, this was very helpful for me. I recommend you maybe pause the video, take a look over it if you're confused and you want to understand this. Um, and I'm just going to say for now, we didn't talk about this GPI part. I kind of skipped this. I'll, I'll explain it briefly in a second, um, but it's not really essential to the algorithm. I think it's more of a minor detail. So feel free to ignore that while you look over this. And that covers the algorithm. So now that we've finally gotten through all that, I know it's a lot, but we can take a look at the results and see how this performs. And it performs pretty well. So if we scroll down here, they have a table that goes over most of their results. And here it is. So I'm just going to go from top to bottom here. And I'm going to talk about each of these because uh, <laughs> some of this stuff is really neat, but I, I also have some criticisms I want to talk about. So the first section right here, and we can, this is really broken down into three sections. First, we're going to go over the top section, and this is a comparison of unsupervised methods. So this at zero right here means that all of these algorithms, they are never presented with an actual task or a reward. They are trained completely unsupervised. And I believe Visor, I'm not sure if the other ones too, but Visor at least is trained for 250 million time steps unsupervised. And what we'll look at is the, I'm going to focus on the full 57 games. These are all Atari games, by the way. I don't know why they have these other subsets. I guess it's because some of these don't have results for all of them. But anyway, we want to look at the median and mean columns. These are the two big ones. And what we'll see is that Visor performs the best out of all these. However, I don't think that this is very important because Visor at the end of the day just isn't an unsupervised algorithm. And I personally take a little bit of issue with using the reward you get from an unsupervised method as a metric. I, I don't want to go too much into this right now, but essentially like we're not trying to maximize the reward. So I don't know why that's what we're looking at, I guess, because it tends to indicate that generally you're making progress because generally if you're not making progress, you don't get reward. But anyway, I, I don't think this section is very important. Um, the next thing we have though is this middle section right here. And this middle section is fully supervised. So as you can see, visor isn't right here. And I guess this was just to give some benchmarks, but I'm going to be honest. I don't like this section either because you can see that they just pulled these numbers, which I mean is, is would be fine if these numbers were standardized, but you can see that they all have different number of time steps they were trained for. So I don't know. We, we, it's, you can't really draw a direct comparison from this. So I guess maybe it's better to have these than to not have these, but not having these standardized, I, I don't know. It just makes them hard to compare. And I, I'm not a huge fan of that. But what's finally interesting, sorry, I got into the results and then show you the boring stuff first, but <laughs> here's the exciting stuff is we have an ablation of visor. So you'll see that these bottom four right here are all different visor variants. So GPI visor, this is the full visor. And what you'll see is that it performs very well. As a matter of fact, it performs the best out of all these methods. So, and it gets 250 million time steps unsupervised, which I will say is a lot. And then it has a hundred thousand steps where it has a reward, which is not very much, but maybe a lot when you consider the fact that it got 250 million to learn the successor features. And then you can see we have three other variants right here. So the RF visor, it removes the BMI metric not the metric, but the the thing that's essentially trying to learn diverse policies, right? And you can see that when we do that, it performs a lot worse, showing that this is quite important. Then we have 
visor without GPI. And I didn't really cover GPI, but GPI essentially just what it means is that instead of using one policy to decide its actions, it's actually using 10 different policies and then taking the maximum Q value action from all 10 of those policies. And we can do that because we're using universal successor features, right? Which is, it's very easy to get the Q value for policies. We just say, you know, we take the uh, successor features of this, oop, and then we pass in some policy uh, and then do the lat. So, so all we have to do is calculate this formula for different policies, which is very cheap. And I went over this a bit earlier in the video, but that's essentially all GPI is doing. It's, it's a minor detail and that's why I'm not going in depth into it. But what you should take away from this is that visor performs pretty well. And one interesting thing that we can also take away from this that's not about visors, actually about Dian. I, I don't know if that's how people pronounce it, but Dian was actually, I think, a, a big influence for visor. And it's it uses this whole BMI thing, but in a little bit of a different way. And you can see that it actually performs very poorly, very, very poorly. And not just here, but up here too, when it's fully unsupervised. And I thought this was interesting because Diane performs very well in the paper where they show it off, but they I think I think they only do not Atari environments. It's like deep mind control suite environments or something like that. I just thought it was interesting that this algorithm was based off Diane. However, Diane itself actually performs very poorly. I'm not entirely sure where that is, but there you go. And if we scroll down here, you can see there are some more results, but I am going to leave these up to you to look over them if you're interested, because I now want to take some time. This video is already long enough. I want to talk about what I think are some of the highlights of this paper, but also some of my criticisms of the paper. I want to start out by saying, overall, I really like this paper. I think it's a great paper. So let's say pros. Um, I like it. <laughs> Maybe that's not um, you know, a pro of the paper, uh, but I've been reading a lot of papers recently, and I think it's really easy to just find lots of issues with papers and immediately dislike them. And it's hard for me to dislike Visor, even though, as I'm going to get into, there are lots of criticisms, because the idea is really neat. It's I think it's it's quite novel. Um, it uses two other ideas, but it combines them in a simple, simple but novel way. Uh, and that simplicity is something I also appreciate. Uh, the combining of the W and Z, as we as we showed, um, actually makes this algorithm quite simple to implement. I implemented this in a Google notebook, and it did not take me too long to get through. So that's another great thing. And this paper also has an answer to a problem in reinforcement learning that I think goes fairly unaddressed, or at least it's not very popular, and that's how to transfer what you learn. And transferring what you learn, you know, we have things like transfer learning, but as it turns out in reinforcement learning, that does not work all too well. And it's something that people don't talk about much, but it's so essential to the idea of generalization. So I was happy to see this paper tackle it. And then I'll also add on this simplicity really quick, because I, I do think the algorithm, the ideas are complex, the algorithm is simple, which I always love. Now, I do want to talk about some critiques though. I'm not sure if that should be how you spell critiques because there were definitely some things that I didn't like about this paper. The one thing was this whole setting W equal to Z. Now I mentioned this, this is a good thing, but I don't think that they talked about this enough. This is really the key thing that they're adding. And unfortunately they don't explore how this affects the algorithm. They do perform ablations as you saw for some variations of visor, but they don't do any ablations for seeing what happens when you don't set these equal to each other. And I have a feeling that it actually has a big impact for what I was talking about earlier in the video. So I, this is my biggest critique. I wish they would have talked about this more. Maybe they tried it out and it wasn't very different, but they probably would have put in the ablation. So I don't know. I, I think that's a, a lost opportunity um, and something interesting that should be looked into. The other thing is that in the results, they did not standardize the amount of training that was done for certain methods. And again, this wasn't a direct comparison. So I, I'd rather have those there than not have them there, but it would have been much better if they were just standardized. I know that this was because they took them from another paper. You know, I, I'm sure it would have taken time to implement them all, but eh, it, it would have been better if they were standardized. Another thing that we should briefly touch on is that this, this is not an exploration method and that this has a limit to how well it can do. And part of that limitation is because this method doesn't do any sort of exploration. Learning skills uh, can maybe help with that, but it's not a substitution for good exploration, which if you've worked in reinforcement learning, you know that that's important. I don't think this is a huge critique. This is a more minor thing because, you know, this paper, it does what it does well. And I don't think it needs to do exploration, but just to note that if you're going to try and apply this, 
you're probably going to need to combine it with exploration, which actually there has been some work on that. I think a paper called APS or APT or APC, I, I forget. It's something like that uh, that does exactly that. And the last thing I want to mention is this question right here, which is, is the no reward setting important? And this is a hard question. This actually is not a critique I personally have. I, I believe the answer to this is yes, the no reward setting is important. And by that, I'm referring to the idea where we start off with no reward function and then we get a reward function later. Is this an important setting? Is it like practical? One thing that I've had someone told me is that, you know, I can't imagine, or rather they can't imagine in a scenario where a reward function wouldn't be present. Like why don't we always have a reward function? And this is something I personally disagree with because I can absolutely imagine a setting where an agent's just car kind of sitting idling. We don't have anything for it to do. And I think even if we didn't have those times though, there's going to be times when we're working on some tasks, but we still want to use some compute to learn general things that are not specific to that task. And I think this, uh, this paper applies to that situation too. Um, so I, I personally don't agree with this critique, but it is something I've heard. So I wanted to mention it uh, because other people, you know, other people might feel similarly. I'm not sure. Anyway, I hope you found this very interesting. And if you have, do, again, I'll ask one last time, do consider subscribing. It really means a lot to me and I'm doing my best to put out some content that hopefully you'll find entertaining. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and I hope to catch you next time.